welcome back to the NTU 2020 Open House. I am Bambi and I'm from Wikim Wee School of Communication and Information. I'm a Year 4 Broadcast student. And I'm Rachel, a Year 1 Sociology student from the School of Social Sciences. So thank you USP for the wonderful talk. Thanks Pai for moderating the whole session. And now we're going to be moving on to our next one, which is a School of Humanities panel discussion. If you've got any questions, send them in. We're going to have all the department people to talk about the different courses as well. Yeah. Yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> Hi, good morning, a very good morning to everyone for joining us today here on NTU Open House 2020. Uh, thanks so much for coming up bright and early on a Saturday to join us here with the School of Humanities faculty panel. My name is Jared, I'm the SOH Club's president and I'll be your moderator for today. Um, just, let's just kick things off, uh, I'll actually get the professors to introduce themselves. Uh, we'll start off with Professor Jernigan, our Associate Chair for Academics, to share a little bit more about the school. And the professors will one by one share more about their program, how long they've been here, and what they actually teach here in the School of Humanities. Prof Jernigan, okay. please. Yeah, thanks, Jared. And yeah, I'd like to thank you all for coming out today. Obviously, these are not ideal circumstances. We'd love to meet you all in person. We'd love to talk to you about in, in person. We'd love to introduce the school in person. But this is not to be this year. Uh, in any case, as Jared said, I'm the Associate Chair for the School of Humanities. I'm also a literature professor. Okay, I teach courses in modern drama and uh, science and literature. Uh, I'm here with five faculty from the School of Humanities, okay, representing each of the five subject areas. The subject areas being uh, English, philosophy, history, linguistics, and Chinese. And uh, each of them will take a time to introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Aus van Dongen. I'm with the history program, and I've been with the program since 2013. Uh, I teach courses on modern and contemporary China, uh, for example, on intellectual history, uh, history of migration. And I also teach certain uh, core courses, meaning courses on uh, what is historiography, how do we write history, and a survey course on uh, Asia Pacific and global history since uh, 1800. Hello everyone, my name is Ivan Panovic. I'm in Linguistics and Multilingual Studies where I teach sociolinguistic courses such as Language and Society, the Sociolinguistics of Globalization, Language and Sexuality, Language and Food. And I've been here for six years now, enjoying it. <laughs> oh, hi, I'm Michelle Chiang. I have been with SOH for three years now. I teach Film Theory, Theatre of the Absurd, Major authors study Samuel Beckett's and Introduction to Singapore Literature. Hi, I'm Chun Chun Teng. I'm with the Chinese program, and this is my fourth year here. And I, here I teach on general courses on Chinese literature and cinema. Uh, for example, I teach classes such as uh, Art and Revolution in the 20th Century, uh, Coming of Age in Modern China, Writing About Places, and uh, Introduction to Chinese Cinema. Hi, I'm Andres Luco. I'm with the philosophy program here in the School of Humanities, and I've been with NTU for almost nine years now. I teach modules such as ethics and political philosophy and philosophy of language. I teach a module called Philosophical Methodologies, which is philosophy about philosophy. And right now I'm teaching a course on the philosophy of human evolution. Thank you very much, professors, for giving us a short introduction about yourself. So these are the professors that you'll meet if you join us in the School of Humanities. Uh, we have a lot of questions that we've received over the past few weeks on our Instagram at NTU underscore humanities. However, keep these questions coming in. We'll be answering them live as we go throughout the day. And now, uh, before we take the questions on Slido, as well as the questions that we have, uh, we'll actually just get the professors to introduce a bit more about the program and what you can expect to learn if you join us as a student in the School of Humanities. Can we start with the history program, Prof and Dongan? Hi, yeah, so um, when you think about history, uh, you might first think of um, maybe names and dates and battlefields, things you learned in uh, JC or secondary school, but that's really not how we do history at NTU. For us, history is about exploring a range of experiences from different perspectives, and they actually uh, go beyond human experiences. So uh, we also teach courses and do research on topics such as the history of animals, history of the environment, religion, and even the history of food. And we also believe that um, history should be taught in a different way. And uh, so our program is organized around four broad areas. 
And um, so one area would be what we call global Asia, meaning we look at Asia and how it's connected to the world. So we would have courses on topics ranging from the Malay world to the history of the Silk Road, for example. And then we have uh, world history. So this is history beyond Asia. But again, we're interested in global connections. So here we would offer courses on topics such as the history of popular culture, but also things such as the history of slavery. And then we also emphasize what we call interdisciplinary history, meaning we're not just studying history per se, but we want to understand how it intersects with areas such as science, technology, medicine, or business. And finally, uh, we emphasize what we call applied history, meaning um, we sort of want to equip you with certain uh, practical skills for the working place, such as programming, filmmaking, and so on. And also skills uh, pertaining to what we call public history, um, history in the public realm, uh, such as, for example, if you want to work in a museum, what does it mean? What kind of skills uh, do you need? And finally, um, about us, so we're all, we're a very young program. We're all uh, very young and dynamic. Uh, we're trained at excellent universities around the world. And uh, we're very passionate about what we do. And uh, we look forward uh, to meeting you. And I look forward to answering any more questions you might have. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I come from linguistics and multilingual studies. And very often when you tell to someone that you're a linguist, people will ask you, how many languages do you speak? <laughs> So this is not what we do. So how many do you speak? I speak four, five maybe, <laughs> but you don't have to speak that many or you can speak more and you can learn more at our Center for Modern Languages and it's nice to know more languages to, for, for a better comparative perspective as a linguist. But what we do study is actually how you become bilingual or multilingual, how you acquire language, the, the languages that you acquire uh, as a child, the languages that you learn later, how languages uh, that we use mediate our social and cultural life. Uh, we also have uh, different concentrations in our programs, so you can follow a more uh, language and technology oriented path, uh, study things such as uh, machine translation and language processing, uh, understand how Google Translate, translates, make it translate better. Uh, you can take a more psycholinguistic uh, path or neurolinguistic path uh, or sociolinguistic uh, path. We also, like historians, have these combinations language and X, quite a lot of them language and the environment, language and gender, language and sexuality. We will teach you how languages change across time and space. We will also help you understand um, uh, what languages do for us as social beings or how you can go about document uh, languages that are on the verge of, of extinction. So uh, all in all, you're uh, not going to become polyglot just by joining us. You're not going to become a grammar Nazi, but you're going to open a, a, a window onto a fascinating world of what it means to be human because it is really something that distinguishes us as, as a species, our uh, capacity to communicate using language. Hi, um, I'm from the English Literature Program. With us, you will be exposed to a range of literary texts from Chaucer all the way up to Murakami. Now, what this means is you'll be exposed to Western literature as well as literature, Asian literature, either written in English or um, in translation. Okay. Now, um, the books aside, we also read films and plays, um, and we're highly interdisciplinary. This means that we look at the intersection between literature and history, literature and linguistics, Chinese, philosophy. So we look at the intersection uh, between these disciplines. Um, and also we offer, at the English program, we offer the film minor and the creative writing minor. So um, that's kind of cool. Um, all right, so now about our faculty members. We all come from highly diverse background, um, but we all share a deep commitment to creating an inspiring environment for you to develop into critical thinkers who are able to respond intelligently to human issues um, in your immediate reality. So we'll share a bit more later, but I'm good for now. Hi. 
So when you think about coming into a Chinese program, you might think that you'll be reading traditional poetry, contemporary novels, you'll learn about Chinese history, politics, you'll learn about uh, the history and culture of overseas uh, Chinese, right? And this is what is written in the Chinese website. <laughs> but, and we do, we do do those things here, <laughs> every one of those things. But we are learning about these different materials with an eye to think about ourselves and our society, and how do we face some of the most pressing issues of our day. So for example, my college teacher class called Animals in Chinese Culture. So in class, they would discuss and read the stories of the monkey king, the legend of the lady of the right snake, right? But whether this is about traditional folklore or their modern adaptations in cinemas, what eventually we are discussing are issues of gender, the position of animals and human, and how do we revisit those positions as they are constructed in our culture, and how do we, like, is, is it a time for us to rethink those position, positionalities today? Another example is that I teach a class called Writing Places. So whether this writing is about the native village, is about this urban uh, contemporary city that we live in today, or it is about nature, what eventually we are discussing is our identity. Where do we anchor our identity? Is it in the native tongue, in the city, or and how do we? What, what is our relationship with nature? So, so whether whatever kind of text that we draw from Chinese culture, we are always relating it to our time and ourselves, and to think how do we add today? Thank you. All right, well, uh, a lot of people ask me what philosophy is, and I think the best place to start is just with the word philosophy itself. So the word philosophy originates from the Greek word philosophia, and if you break that word down, uh, philo means to love, and sophia means wisdom. So literally, philosophy just means to love wisdom, and truly, I think that's the heart of philosophy. Uh, philosophers share a deep love for wisdom and they grapple with questions uh, that people have been raising for thousands of years. Questions like, what is the source of knowledge? Do human beings have free will? What kind of a life should we lead? And in some cases, these questions are, are very abstract, uh, but uh, no less riveting. And we will explore those questions uh, with you here in the School of Humanities. Uh, we also ask a lot of questions that are much more of an applied nature. So we ask questions uh, like uh, uh, questions in philosophy of science that have to do with quantum mechanics and our place in a, a quantum mechanical universe. We ask questions about the rights that animals might have and how people in the state ought to treat them. And we ask questions about uh, research ethics and how uh, researchers and medical professionals ought to conduct their research, we offer courses in those more applied areas as well. Finally, we offer a, a broad range of courses in different traditions of philosophy and in different areas of philosophy. So we offer courses in branches of philosophy as diverse as the philosophy of science, uh, ethics, metaphysics, uh, philosophy of religion, logic, epistemology, which is the theory of knowledge, and so on. Uh, we also offer uh, courses uh, across different historical and cultural traditions in philosophy, like Chinese philosophy, European philosophy, uh, 20th century existentialist philosophy, uh, contemporary uh, uh, Anglo-American analytic philosophy, uh, and so on. And uh, as to our faculty, uh, we're uh, a, a diverse group of uh, international researchers uh, and uh, we all share uh, a deep love uh, for, for wisdom, uh, for philosophy, uh, which we would like to transmit uh, to our students. And in so doing, we hope to teach you basic skills in communication and argumentation. Uh, we want you not just to study ideas, but be able to formulate your own ideas and express them clearly, uh, and also to pre pre present logical arguments uh, to show that your uh, ideas make sense, to show that they're, they're true. And I think that those skills will come in very handy for you uh, in the future, whatever uh, uh, path uh, you choose to take. 
Uh, so thank you for your attention. I, I think it's very nice that uh, thanks so much to the professors for sharing with us what the program is about. And we keep hearing this word interdisciplinary being thrown. Almost every of the professors said it. Humanities is interdisciplinary, which is why we actually. Uh, I have this question that, that we just see uh, is that we, we do offer things like double majors and second majors mm -hmm. and this actually allows students to study more than one major because humanities is so interdisciplinary, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, Prof. Daniel, could you bring us through what, what exactly is the difference between a second major and a double major? Yeah, thanks, Jared. Thanks, Jared. Yeah, the second major, double major, minor, these are all ways of keeping open your interests and in other subject areas, okay? We're all not all tunnel vision focused on a single subject area. Most of us have interdisciplinary interests. Every course that I've heard mentioned today is a course that if I had time, I would be glad to sit in, okay? Uh, the double major is perhaps the, the, the largest way of keeping your foot in two different subject areas, okay? If you are doing the double major, say, in English literature and art history, or psychology and linguistics and multilingual studies, you're evenly spit, split sorry, between those two subject areas. You're taking just as many courses in one subject as you are in the other subject, okay? By contrast, okay, and some of the universities use these, this terminology differently, okay? So at, at NTU, if you're doing a second major by contrast to a double major, you still have a primary major, say history, and then you can do a second major maybe in philosophy, and in that case, you take the bulk of your courses in history and you take a lesser number of courses in philosophy. And what about the minors then? What's and the minors is, is kind of a, uh, even less of a connection to that, that second area, okay? For the minor, if you're doing a major in history and a minor in philosophy, then you do five courses in, in philosophy. So it's very nice because in the School of Humanities, we are not only able to study a single area that we're interested in. I can study up to two and even up to maybe one major and two minors? You could do two minors, yeah. you could. And, and it's great because, you know, you're paying one school fee for oh, three <laughs> different subjects, which is, which is amazing. And... Um, one question that I see repeatedly on our Instagram is that how different is content taught in JC and secondary school and polytechnics compared to the content in university? I think it's very interesting because we have the exact same subject name, right? English, Chinese, history. Uh, maybe Prof Chen going to bring us through some of the misconceptions that people have about, for example, JC English or and university English. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, for English literature, at JC level, I think you spend two years um, studying a handful of texts. Now, in, in, at university level, you'll be exposed to a new text every week uh, for each module. Um, this, means what, this means that the breadth is much wider now uh, compared to when you were at JC, in JC. Um, but also the depth, okay, we go deeper into each text. As I mentioned earlier, it's a highly interdisciplinary program. Um, this means then that we will be going into the, the philosophical influences on, on certain writers um, and we'll, we'll be thinking about the historical context in which these texts are written in. Uh, so this means that it's wider breadth and deeper depth. All right, now in terms of assessment components, at JC level, maybe you, you go through um, an exam at the end of the semester. Now, for at university level, for my module, for example, I teach theater of the absurd, there are four assessment components, right? So that's the final essay, um, that's performance, so you adapt a text to perform, um, then there's presentation and finally response papers, right? So you'll see that there's more variety in terms of assessment components. So that's that's a key difference as well. So in summary, breadth, depth, and assessment components. Um, so that's one thing. And and also clearly, um, we we offer creative writing um, <laughs> modules as well. So that's kind of different. Um, you'll be you'll be taught the craft of writing, and I think that's really. Um, great for budding creative writers out there, or potential poets and novelists in the future. Yeah. And, and it's very nice because not only do we have a creative writing in English, we have one in Chinese mm -hmm. as well, right? Yes, Prof. we do. Yeah. <laughs> so we have creative writing, um, but we have 
uh, there are two minors in the Chinese program. There's creative writing and there's translation. And in creative writing, there's also a part which focuses on media writing. So how do you write uh, news release on, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But a lot of what Michelle just said regarding the difference of uh, pedagogy in university and JC stands true as well for the Chinese program. And I think even though we are, the, the way we read is not, the, the way we teach text and the way we demand your writing is not so much to train your skill, train your language skills. We also do that because we demand a lot of reading and writing. But, but at the end, what we, are look, what we are trying really to hone are the skills of thinking and reading. So there are a lot more classroom discussions than what you have experienced in JC. And um, for example, I teach coming of age in modern China. So the, the assessments that I give the students are, you know, you not only have to read what those young authors have uh, addressed and discussed in their writing when they are coming of age, for example, during the wartime, during Cultural Revolution, during 1980s China or Taiwan, but I also demand my students to do a personal essay to reflect on how they grew up in Singapore and how their individual identity and their, uh, you know, their personality are shaped by the society that they grow up. And that personal essay, they, it can take the form of just an essay or it can be a poetry, a song, a video. The, the format is completely open, but for a creative piece, they would need to do production notes to explain why they do certain things. So, so the goal of our teaching is a lot more on how do we bring those knowledge to think about ourselves. Yeah, so I, I think we share a lot of similarities between the two programs. Um, the objective, I feel, is really to develop multiple perspectives to a single event, a text, or um, a, a human issue. So I think this is at the core, at the heart of, of, our, of SOH, really, multiple perspectives. And it's very nice because we keep thinking that humanities is something that is theoretical, it's abstract, it has no application to the real world. But in fact, it's the total opposite. I think it's the most amount of application to the real world, um, given the changing context in the 21st century. Um, just now, uh, Prof, I think you were mentioning that you know the classroom structures are a bit different. And, and it's true that the classroom structures are a bit different here in the School of Humanities. And I know the history program does it slightly differently. So, Prof Van Dong, and could you bring us through that as well? Yeah, so to add to what, already, um, what has already been said, um, so there's basically two kind of structures, so we often get questions about this. So one is the lecture tutorial <coughs> format, and one is the seminar format. And the lecture tutorial means you first, you sit in a larger auditorium, and the professor will, will give a lecture about a certain topic, but then you'll be split into smaller tutorial groups where you uh, do what we call interactive learning, and you sort of discuss and you also learn from each other. So the emphasis is also on learning from your peers. And the same thing happens uh, in, in the seminar. And so this could be, um, the lecturer could also use all kinds of digital media, different types of sources, as has already been mentioned, uh, for the learning, um, making for a much more creative and challenging experience, I would say. And so just to add on, on the uh, assignments, so we've already seen that the assignments can be very creative. And for us, that's actually the same. So in addition to personal essays, uh, reviews, uh, we also had students um, make blogs or podcasts um, or even actually uh, put together small exhibitions. So I remember visiting an exhibition where students had made little replicas of scientific instruments for a course on the history of science and technology. So as you can see, right, we really challenge you to apply your knowledge and to have a, a sort of different uh, and, and very varied learning experience. And, and I think this is only possible because our professors come from all over the world and they bring across pedagogies and how they were taught all across the world back here home in NTU. And our students as well go all over the world and some of the people online are asking, um, is it true that every student gets at least one chance to go overseas in NTU? Prof. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jared. Yeah, we, 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 go, we find overseas experience crucial to education in the 21st century, okay? And NTU has worked incredibly hard to make uh, all kinds of options available for students. Uh, apparently, we're up to about 80% of students on going on some type of overseas uh, 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 
education yeah. program. Okay. Uh, in fact, I think probably the only ones who don't go are ones who maybe have different interests. Okay, mm -hmm. or do something local instead. Okay. So, so uh, yes, yes, there is a bar that you have to meet in order to go. We encourage you all to do well in your studies, and if you do well in your studies, it will assist you in going yeah. on exchange. But basically, everybody has the opportunity. Everybody has. And, and this is something interesting because everybody has opportunity to go for exchange. And exchange is something that I think every student who comes in is super excited to go. Um, so sometimes, you know, we are curious about whether or not it's difficult going alone overseas and traveling overseas alone um, can be quite a difficult thing to do. Uh, Prof Panovich, have you heard of any horror stories that you'd like to share with the audience yeah. here today? Well, uh Yes, uh, I also work as, a, as an exchange coordinator for, for the Linguistics and Multilingual Studies program and not really horror stories, but you see, I come from Serbia, which is Southeast Europe. Sometimes people mishear it as Siberia. We do have <laughs> cold winters there, but it's not as dramatic as Siberia. But being from Serbia, I'm very happy to be in a tropical country, <laughs> to be somewhere where it's always summer. But our students, they go to really all over the world. I mean, NTU is a world-class university, and students decide to go something I find shocking, to Scandinavia. <laughs> and they enjoy the cold weather. But the point is, you know, it's, it's not just about you go to another university so that you want to take specific courses that are given there. It's the whole package. It's the, it's the cultural experience. It's, it's uh, new uh, tastes, new uh, sounds, uh, new sights that you'll be experiencing. So yes, students can, can find courses that we do not offer here, uh, but they can also uh, you know, take, take uh, this as an opportunity for uh, personal growth, uh, gaining new cultural experiences, uh, mastering languages that they already uh, have been studying. So some of them don't go that far. They may go to Japan <laughs> and stay in, their, in, in the neighborhood because they want to improve their Japanese. So yes, I think uh, exchange is a, is, a, is a fantastic opportunity and you should not be afraid of going on your own. Probably there are going to be some other students on, at the same university. So there are no horror stories, only good experiences. Only good experiences. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe in retrospect, they start to enjoy it a bit more. Exactly. <laughs> and, and we talked about experiences in the academic sphere and going overseas for different academic opportunities. Um, there are some worries that I think uh, we need to dispel this myth here today the professors that um, is it true that as a humanities student it's difficult to find a job uh, I, I think here in the School of Humanities we do have opportunities for students to level up themselves in a career which is why we have the professional attachment program Prof. Jen Gun, could you explain yeah, a bit thank more? you thank you uh, yes uh, certainly when you're in a humanities program, there's a lot of concern, okay? What is the job expectations for this, okay? And I think Prof. Luco is going to talk about this a little bit in a minute, okay? But one of the things that makes uh, the experience here at NTU better than other places is how hard we work with you to go on attachment, okay? To take up an internship, okay? And, that, and one thing to remember about is that the internship that you take up is usually about 10 weeks, and it gets you both credit for university and salary while you're doing the attachment, oh. okay? So, uh, best of both worlds. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's great because most of these students on these professional attachment programs, they do sometimes get offered jobs by the companies and they do go on to work with them as well. Many, I've heard many cases where a student went on attachment and then got a job from the company they went on attachment. Yeah, that's great. So the myth is busted, right? It's not a humanity students cannot find jobs. And so for Prof. Luke goes into philosophy, right? And we ask a big questions. So how how will studying humanities actually guarantee or help our students in uh, getting a job in this complex job market and this world now? It's a great question, Jared. Thanks. Yeah. Well, our students in philosophy, and I think this goes for all the students in the School of Humanities, have been quite successful in pursuing a number of very different uh, career paths. Uh, ones that you might even find surprising. So there are so. Uh, many different fields that our students have gone into. I, I need a list here that I've, uh, <laughs> you know, been fortunate enough to bring with me. So our students have gone into careers including uh, the private sector, management, finance, charity sector, uh, IT management, uh, government, the media. Uh, we've had a student work for the Straits Times. Uh, we've had uh, students uh, who were entrepreneurs and started up 
uh, their own uh, tutorial company. Uh, so as you can see, it's a very diverse uh, set of, of career paths that our, our students have taken and that they've been very successful. I also want to add that if you're, you're curious about uh, starting salaries, uh, there's some very helpful information that's publicly available uh, on the MOE website. And just to make a long story short, the starting salaries of our students from the School of Humanities uh, are competitive uh, with uh, <laughs> graduates uh, from, from other schools and from other colleges. So there's no need to worry. Tell your parents, tell your friends, tell your family, we are competitive. <laughs> <laughs> Very competitive, if I can add. Yeah, and so, so it's not true, the myth is dispelled. Uh, we, we do have career opportunities and we do get good jobs with good salaries. And so now we have a question on the Slido. Uh, they're actually asking us, um, so this is the Prof. Michelle and Prof. Ivan. Um, what is the difference between English and linguistics and multilingual studies? Who wants to go first? I, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a misconception about well, people are not very sure when they see the English program. Do we study in the English language? Uh, no, it's actually English literature. So we look at literary texts, everything that I've introduced earlier. Um, before I pass this over to, to Ivan, um, I, I, I forgot, I missed out something earlier when you asked me about the difference between JC, Poly yeah. and University. I didn't highlight the Poly part. Now, some of my best students are from Polytechnics. So speaking of new experiences, um, if you're from Poly, don't feel like you're disadvantaged in any way. Some of my best students are from Polytechnic, um, Mass Communications. A lot of them are from SCOM. So I teach film theory, right? Um, these students already have practical experiences in filmmaking, for mm -hmm. example. So when we encounter film theory, theor theoretical texts that involve a lot of technical terms, um, they are already very well positioned. They understand these texts and the practicalities of it. Um, so don't feel like because you're from Poly, then you're disadvantaged in any way. Come join us and, mm -hmm. and experience um, literature. You enjoy it. Not a defense from LMS. <laughs> ah, yes. Okay. Well, I guess, you know, as a linguist, you very often are in a position to kind of, you know, dismantle these misconceptions. Uh, so very often what happens to me, uh, if I'm, if I'm uh, riding a taxi, a uh, taxi uh, driver would ask me, oh, so what do, you, what do you do? And I say, it's like, oh, what do you teach? I say linguistics. Oh, you know, do you teach English? Uh, <laughs> or like, which language do you teach? So, yes, just as, as in English program, they focus on literature uh, and uh, cultural studies and film studies. Uh, in linguistics, we take a broader outlook on language, on faculty of language. So I always tell people, like, I teach in English, but I teach about languages. So, so, so our scope is, uh, is wider. Uh, we uh, draw on examples from across the world, how various languages function, if you look at the structure of language, or if we are uh, looking into more uh, questions on, on uh, language acquisition, then of course uh, uh, you're going to be drawing on psychology, on medicine, uh, biology, uh, physiology, and so on and so forth. So, so yes, I think you know we do have sometimes we we overlap in certain in certain fields, especially when it goes more towards discourse analysis, uh, textual linguistics, sociolinguistics. But then there are aspects of linguistics, parts of linguistics where we. Uh, really, kind of drift away from from our what our colleagues do, and I would also like to 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 uh, agree with Michelle that yes, uh, you know, my some of our best students are also coming from Poly. So even if you haven't heard of linguistics, but you're intrigued, come join us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's just take a few more questions here. Uh, we have one for Prof Ting. Um, the question is uh, whether or not they'll be in a disadvantaged position uh, after learning Chinese in school humanities for four years when the working language in Singapore is predominantly English. Is, is that going to be a problem for the students? Okay. Thank you. I think that's a common concern for students who are considering Chinese. Mm. So <clears throat> I want to remind everyone here that actually when you come into the Chinese program at NTU, half of your credit, 50% of your credit, will be taught in Chinese in the Chinese program. Another 50% of those credits you are taking from other courses, other uh, programs. So those will be taught in English. So actually, when you graduate, you had you are Chinese. Chinese program offers this unique advantage that you will be a bilingual candidate for any kind of jobs. 
So other than the traditional jobs that you become a Chinese teacher in Singapore <laughs> schools, or you go and work for a Chinese media company, either it's a TV or, or, or a newspaper, mm -hmm. there are also a lot of job opportunities for any companies who have to work with China. Because as a graduate from the Chinese program, you have learned about Chinese economics, politics, history, linguistics, and you are much more learned in terms of Chinese culture. So, mm -hmm. so our, our, our graduates are very competitive in going to, into any kind of uh, companies, actually, as long as they require bilingual skills and knowledge about contemporary China. Yeah. Thanks, Prof. Thanks. So not only are they disadvantaged, this, uh, not only are they not disadvantaged, they are actually at a greater advantage than, than the rest of the peers because they do understand the cultural complexities and history and stuff like that. Alright, uh, we'll take a few more. To Prof and Dong, um, is there an advantage uh, if you have studied history in A-levels? Does it make it easier for you? Okay, well thanks for the question. It's related to some of the other questions, right? So I would say if you have studied history in A-levels, you have a certain foundation, yes. But all students who come in will take uh, mm -hmm. a sort of foundational course, um, 1001, What is History?, whereby we actually teach you to think differently about history. So everybody will actually um, will be asked to think about history in a different way, right? So yes, you have a foundation, but the way we do history is very different. So you can build on a foundation, but you'll also be challenged as to what you've learned before. And I also want to emphasize that um, if you come from Poly, there is absolutely no need to worry because in our program, the same thing, some of our best students also from Poly. So in addition to the training that everybody receives, regardless of A-levels or Poly background, it's also very much, I think, about your commitment and your interest. So what we see generally is that students who are really passionate will do well regardless of their background. So, so yeah, so you shouldn't be uh, frightened by the fact that you don't have a sort of A-level foundation in history. Yeah. Great, great, great. Yeah, I think a lot of this is like they're asking like, oh, uh, if I've done this before, will it help me? What about in the philosophy program where most people have probably not done um, philosophy in JC or Poly? And also how will studying philosophy um, actually benefit a person as a, either in a career or as an individual? I love this question, uh, actually. Um, I have to ponder it. No, uh, uh, in limited time. Uh, well, let me just say that uh, fundamentally philosophy uh, will train you in some very useful so-called soft skills uh, that uh, would uh, be beneficial to you in whatever walk of life you choose. So uh, in philosophy, uh, what do we do? Well, we, uh, we, we read about ideas, uh, we discuss them and we debate them. And in doing so, you learn uh, to read carefully uh, uh, texts and analyze them and break them down uh, to their logical structure. And then you see if the argument in the text is successful in proving its conclusion. So you learn a bit about how to think logically. Uh, in addition, you have to be able to express yourself because you'll be expected uh, to write uh, essays, uh, to do oral presentations uh, where uh, your challenge will be to, to prove a point. And in so doing, you'll have to uh, be able to construct a, a, logical, a logical argument uh, which is clearly expressed. Uh, so logical thinking, clear communication, uh, these are skills uh, that will be trained uh, quite uh, heavily uh, in a philosophy program. And uh, as I've found, and I think a lot of our graduates have found, uh, their useful skills anywhere. Uh, as to uh, other things, uh, you know, I, I would just say that uh, you know, philosophy has just opened up a, a lot of new vistas for me. Um, I, I think about questions uh, that uh, I never thought I would think about uh, before, and uh, I feel like you know, I, I've, I've gained just uh, through uh, the you know, encounter with philosophy and, and learning about so many things uh, about the world and my place in it uh, that I, I can't imagine doing anything else with my life. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you'd like to find out more how Prof. Luku operates, you should come on down and join us in the philosophy program. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think now for the most important question of the day, uh, Prof. Jernigan, how can people who are interested in joining the school committees actually apply? Okay, well, yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, 
go to the web page. Go to the NTU web page. You should be able to find a drop down menu with the admissions. Okay, you follow through the admissions portal. Okay, and you uh, put in an application. Uh, the School of Humanities, uh, as a part of the admissions process, has both an interview and a written test. Okay, so eventually we would invite you in to do the interview and the admissions test, and then we make a determination from there. Okay, it's basically a holistic admissions process. Okay, uh, every year we're encouraged to think more holistically about what type of student really does their best in a program like this, okay? And so even if you maybe didn't get the marks that you were hoping for and you're worried that those marks might not be up to point, apply anyway, okay? Because it could be that the holistic admissions process works in your favor. Thanks. <laughs> and, and, and it's true, right? Because we don't only look at um, grades on its own because you're going to study such a, uh, such a in-depth topic for four years, we have to be very sure that people are interested and curious yeah, about the question. Yeah. And, and it's great because in humanities, we don't only look at grades, we look on a whole. Um, that sadly has come to the end of the faculty panel today. Um, thank you, audience, for joining us. Thank you, professors, for being here with us today. Um, do continue asking questions on the Slido, as well as on Instagram at NTU underscore humanities. Uh, we'll be back here again at 1 p.m. with our students. So now we have the profs. Next up, we have the students. So do continue asking questions. Uh, thank you so much for being with us this Saturday morning, and we'll see everyone here in August. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Hope to see you in August. <laughs>